this morning, James uses an interesting word there, and I want to try to help us define it the way James meant it and um, uh, talk about true religion this morning. But before we get into that, Pastor Herrick always starts off with his humorous anecdote. An old man and woman hated each other but remained married for many years. Huh? Does that sound for all? Oh. Uh, during the shouting fights, the old man constantly warns his wife. Uh-oh, Mike. There it is. If I die first, I will dig my way up and out of the grave and come back and haunt you the rest of your life. One day, the man abruptly died. After the burial, one of the wife's friends asked if she isn't worried about her husband digging himself out of the grave. The wife smiles. Let the old bugger dig. I had him buried upside down. <laughs> He'll start digging the wrong direction. He'll never make his way out of there to come and haunt me. Okay, we're going to look at, uh, again, the book of James and working our way through, working our way through the... Um, Chapter 1 of the book of James, these are the last two verses in chapter 1. Uh, here's our text for this morning. Okay, let me read that for you. Just two verses, just two verses this morning. James says this, starting with verse 26. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. I want you to think about the Christianity. We talked about this uh, last week a little bit. The Christianity that James is, is preaching against in his book. There seems to be a lot of carnality in the, in the lives of the Christians that he's writing to, and he tries to, to straighten them out. The problem was they didn't think they were carnal. They thought they were pretty good. He says here, if anyone thinks that he is religious, you need to look at your life a little more. You know, this is the problem. Many times we think that we're doing pretty good in our Christian life, when maybe there are areas that we still need to get squared around in our life. He uses that word, religious, or religion. I want to talk about that word, just a moment. My battery's going, Mike. I may have to move over there, and just like you did, and hit that button. We often use this word, religion, uh, as opposed to the Christian faith. You know, religion, he's religious. We might say, um... He has religion, but I have faith in Jesus Christ. You know, we, we use it that way. We think of religion as Hinduism and Islam and all of the false religions where Christianity is a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, that's the way we often use that, but that's not the way James uses that word here. James uses it in a positive sense. Okay, let's look at that word. The Greek word for that James uses here, translated as religion, is the Greek word theskos, and it has these meanings. These come directly from the lexicon. That's the Greek dictionary for this word. It has the meaning of reverence or worship of God. Okay, some, uh, the way James is using this word religion, he's talk up in, talking about worshiping God. Second definition Worship as expressed in outward acts. And thirdly, just as it's translated, it's translated as religion. Listen, I want to focus in on definition number two there, because I think that is key, that is key to our understanding. The word religion, James says, if anyone thinks he is religion, and then he says, well, his religion is worthless, He's talking about worship as expressed in the outward daily acts of our lives. And that's important for us to realize. We think when we worship God, we do it on Sunday morning when we sing these, these praise hymns and we, we sing loud and we, we worship God. But I want to tell you something. We worship God not only on Sunday morning, but we worship God on Monday morning. We worship God on Saturday night. 
We worship God with our actions. And that's what this word is getting at. James uses the word religion, which means your daily actions which will honor the Lord. Okay? So that's what he means by that term religion. Keep that in mind. Let me stress it again. James uses the word religion, which means worshiping as, ex as expressed in outward acts, the outward acts of our daily life. James looked at those Christians that were around him, and he saw a lot of sin. He saw a lot of carnality that he writes against here in this book. And yet they thought they were pretty religious. They thought they were honoring God. They probably went to church on Sunday morning. Remember, they were hearers of the word, but they weren't doers of the word. Last week's sermon. They would go and they would, they would raise their hands and they would rock and they would sing loud. And then church got done and they'd go out into the, uh, what do they call that in churches? There's narthex or whatever. They'd go out there and they'd get in the corner and start gossiping about something. Did you see what Mike Gates war today to church you know and they would gossip they weren't religious they weren't worshiping and honoring god in their daily actions okay so here's my outline i hope you picked up one of the sheets by the way dan come in and started looking at that and he said what what is that picture at the bottom let me tell you what that picture is we have some personal friends um mickey and mary knew him from our other church um we have some personal friends, Phil and Alana Carmichael. They are administrators of the Pines Christian Care Center for Children in Velcom. It's spelt with a W, but they pronounce it Velcom, Velcom, South Africa. They're missionaries in South Africa running this orphanage. And we have visited there. In fact, we visited there twice. We brought one of the youth from our church uh, last time we were there. Um, and this is a picture of um, they all gathered out on their front steps, their front door, as we were leaving, and we got that picture. If you look real close, Laurel and I and Eugene are in that, in that picture somewhere. But this is the, or this is the orphans. We're going to talk about orphans today. These are the orphans from this, uh, the pines, okay? Um, Three-point outline. Some blanks for you to fill in there, okay? Here's my outline. Number one. Controlling, we worship the Lord with our actions. What are some of these actions? James specifically mentioned several of them. Number one, controlling our language. We can honor and worship the Lord. We can be religious. We can honor and worship the Lord with the kind of language, the kinds of things we say. Secondly, we worship and honor the Lord by helping those in needs. And James happens to mention two categories, orphans and widows, that we can honor the Lord by helping those who are in distress, he uses that word, who are in need, and he specifically mentions visiting orphans and widows. And then thirdly, um, we can honor the Lord by living a pure, unspotted life life those three things so there's my outline today we're going to start working our way through these three points all right number one it is important oh it's important listen i want to make this clear here okay this is not talking about being saved by doing good works all the way through here james is writing to believers at least to those who claim to be believers they were believers that were living carnal lives but they were believers I'm not talking here, James isn't talking about here, oh, I think I'm going to go visit orphans and widows and give a whole lot of money to the poor. That will help earn my way to heaven. No, no, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about, James is writing to those who are already believers in Jesus Christ. They have accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. They've been born again. They've been saved they are trying to live a Christian life, though they had a lot of carnality in it that James is trying to help teach them and get them straightened around. But this passage is talking about not earning your way to heaven, but after you are saved, after a person is saved by faith in Christ Jesus, then he begins to worship the Lord with his actions that are pleasing to him. We get saved. Jesus died on the cross for us. We place our faith and our trust in him now out of our gratitude. And because we have a new spirit within us, 
We want to honor the Lord with our daily life actions. All right. Number one, controlling our language. James says this, if anyone thinks he is religious, okay? He had a lot of people walking around and thinking they were religious. They claimed to be believers. They were there in their, in their local church meetings. James was a, was, a, was a leader in the church there in Acts, and a lot of those people... They were coming every day, and they were, they were brothers. They were Christian brothers and sisters. They were claiming to be religious, but they had a lot of problems in their life. James says here, if anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Isn't that an interesting phrase at the end? You're not honoring God. You, 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 you sing the songs in the worship, you listen to the message, you write notes on the card, and you walk out of church and you are using language that is not honoring to God. You lie, you gossip, you, you, you have corrupt communications with others. huh? He says, if a man does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. The tongue. Now, the tongue. James has a long section later on. Remember how James, I told you, James, that little bit here, a little bit here, a little bit here, a little bit here, but then he comes back, and then he a little bit here, a little bit here, and he comes back. And he's going to come back several times, and he has some strong passages about the tongue, okay? So uh, I'm not going to hit this topic real hard today because James, I'm going to hit it as we get into some of the other chapters, uh, much harder. So I'm not going to hit it very hard here and now, but, <laughs> yeah, when pastors say, but, you know, and in closing, and then they go on for 20 minutes more, you know, but, uh, only to say the word that he uses here for our controlling our tongue translated as bridle. We need to bridle our tongue. Man thinks he's religious, but don't bridle his tongue. What does that word bridle mean? Well, I'm not that much of a horseman. My wife was when she was younger. She, had, she started out with a little ornery Shetland pony, and, and then she got a bigger horse. And then even after we were married, uh, uh, she wanted a horse. And, and so we had, a, we, we, we had a really nice Arab, just a beautiful Arab and then my brother brought over an untrained, uh, kind of a young buckskin, and then somebody gave us an um, old, old, old uh, Shetland pony that was ornerier than everything. And at one time in our married life, we had three horses, and our kids would ride the horse, and Laurel knew quite a bit about horses. But I didn't know what a bridle was. Um, a bridle um, is something that you put on the horse in order to control the horse. I say here, it comes from the Greek word, which literally means a bridle or reins used to control the horse, to control the horse, okay? If you ever tried to hop on a horse and, you know, you see the Indians do it out west, they jump on the horse and they grab a hold of the mane. Well, <laughs> that horse is going to want to go where he wants to go. I remember one time uh, uh, my little daughter, she was like five years old and she was on the big Arab and that Arab was a, well, he, uh, when we took the, they were in this little fenced off pasture area and when we took another horse out of the pasture, that horse would prance up and down the, the fence and his chest would puff out and he was just a beautiful looking horse. But he had a mind of his own and my daughter was riding him and he wanted to go back into the barn and get some hay and no matter what she did, that horse was heading for the barn and he started to head for this um, low hanging door and as it turned out, my, my daughter grabbed onto the top of the door, was raked off of the top of the horse and she's hanging there by the top of the door and the horse went in the barn and did what he wanted to do. Well, we have reins and we have bits. James, a little later, is going to talk about bits in the horse's mouth. We have reins and we have bridles so that we can control the horse. Make it do what it is supposed to do. James uses that word about our tongue. We need to bridle our tongue. Our tongue wants to do and go where it wants to go. 
And we need to yank back on those reins and say, whoa, tongue, whoa. We need to control that. That's the exact word that he uses there in that verse. True worship to God includes the tongue. So true worship of God in our daily lives, religion, that's that word, includes our bridling or our reining in of our tongue. I don't know if you know much about horses, but I have learned, Laurel told me this, that a well-trained horse, you don't have to do a lot to. You're riding along with the reins, and you're something I was told I'm not supposed to do. I always grabbed a hold of that saddle horn because I was going to fall off, you know, and said, no, no, you don't grab that saddle horn. You're riding along with the reins, and if you want it to turn, all you got to do is lay the rein on its neck, and it will go in that direction. If you want it to go the other direction, you lay the other rein on its neck. You don't have to jerk. You don't have to yank it. You just lay the rein on its neck, and it knows that you want, it wants you to turn. If you want it to stop, you just you don't yank on it. You just lightly pull back on it, and it knows because it's well-trained. It obeys what the reins tell it to do. We certainly need to do that with our tongue. We can worship God in what we say, but we can also worship God by what we do not say. You know, the other day I was driving, talk with, I was talking with Tom the other day about this. I was driving along, and there was a truck here, and I'm here, and if he's right there, and I'm right here, I'm in his blind spot. And all of a sudden, there was a car stopping in front of him, so he's going to kind of pull over, and he didn't jerk over. Fortunately, he didn't jerk over. He just started coming over in my lane. The only problem was my car was there. You know? And uh, my first reaction was, hey, buddy, what are you doing? And I put on my brakes, and I swerved over in the other lane. And then I remember several times when, I had had somebody in my blind spot, and I pulled over in front of them. So I calmed down. I said, I said, I actually said to myself, John, just calm down. You've made the same mistakes. He didn't do it on purpose. I was in his blind spot, and he didn't see me there. We can worship God by what we say, but we can worship God also by controlling our tongue and not saying things when maybe we want to. James says, true religion, worshiping and honoring God, means that you bridle your tongue. Okay, another interesting point from this verse. I threw this one in afterwards because I got to thinking about that verse. James also puts this phrase in there. James says that a believer can deceive his heart. Um, James says, if any man thinks he is religious and bridles not his tongue uh, and deceives his heart, his religion is in vain, is worthless. He says, he says that the believer can deceive his heart, deceive his heart. Now I want you to think about, think about deception. It is knowing what is wrong. I'm trying to define deception here. It is knowing what is wrong, but convincing somebody else that it's okay. You're going to deceive them, right? Think about, I say, think about uh, the serpent and Eve in the Garden of Eden, okay? The serpent knew, Satan knew that it was wrong for Eve to partake of the fruit of that tree. God had given Adam and Eve that one command. You can partake of all of the fruit of the garden, except not of that tree. That was the one command that God had given Eve. Satan knew that. But what did he do? But he convinced Eve that it was okay for her to disobey God and eat that tree. Did God really say that? You know, and he, the Bible tells us that he is the deceiver and he deceived her. James says we can deceive our hearts. We can deceive ourselves. Think about that. How did I define it? Deceiving is, it is okay uh, it is knowing what is wrong, but convincing someone else it is okay. And we'll do that sometimes. We will know something is wrong, 
Come on, battery. I should have changed my battery beforehand. Uh, James says we can deceive our hearts. We know something is wrong, but we often will convince ourselves that it's okay. No, I know I shouldn't be looking at that. That's not going to help my Christian life. That's not right. Yeah, but I can handle it. It's, it it'll be okay this time. Nobody will know. There's not going to be any problems with it. There's not going to be bad any, any bad outcomes from it. And we can deceive. I, I just thought that that was an interesting phrase, deceiving our hearts. We talk ourselves into sinning. Our conscience says, no, don't do that. But we talk ourselves into it sometimes. Okay, number two. James says that we can honor and worship God by helping those in need. And James specifically mentions orphans and widows in this verse. Religion that is pure and undefiled. There's that word again, religion. Religion, how we honor God, how we worship God, that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this. To visit orphans and widows in their affliction. Um, true worship of God includes helping those in affliction. Now, here's some points I make. James mentions orphans and widows, okay? Now, they certainly represent those who are poor and struggling to get along. It doesn't necessarily have to be an orphan and a widow for you to help them. It could be anybody who is struggling and going through a difficult time, maybe financially, maybe struggling emotionally, and you help them. God is pleased by that. That is a worship of God. But not only do orphans and widows represent anybody who is in distress, uh, they also represent a special class of people called orphans and widows, you know? <laughs> they re they, James literally is talking about orphans and widows. Now, you got to realize, uh, widows in those days um, had it very difficult. It was a different society, um, and widows had a very difficult time making it in life, especially elderly widows, maybe whose husband passed away, and they have to try to live and get along in their elderly years, and life became tough. Orphans who did not have parents there to help them, to, to train them, to, to provide for them. They had it tough in that society. Visit with a purpose. I had looked up this word visit. James says visiting, true religion, and I file before God is this, to visit orphans and widows. And I thought, visit them? Now, when we think of the word visit, if, uh, if, if uh, Dan was going to come over to my house and visit, he'd stop over and I, I, I'd make some coffee on my Keurig, you know, I'd put it in there, and we'd sit down at the table, and Dan would talk for a while. Dan would talk for quite a while, you know Dan. And we'd have two, three cups of coffee, and then Dan would say, oh, I got to get going. Or I might have to say, well, Dan, it's about time for you to get going. But uh, <laughs> Dan would visit that way. We th you know, that's what we mean by the word visit, Right? But the word that's used in the Greek here, it's episkeptomai. Now that skeptomai doesn't mean skeptic. It is kind of related to there. But if you think of the word scope, a microscope, it means to look. Literally, it means to look with the prefix upon, to look upon. And it meant more than just visiting the way we think of it. It means more than just a visit. It means to visit with the purpose of giving comfort and help and relief. You know what? Well, good with it. If there's this group of orphans and you come over there and you visit them and you talk with them for a little while and then you leave. You know, <laughs> James means more than that. It means to visit them with the purpose of comfort and relief. Let me show you a verse that, that shows that. Luke chapter 1, verse 6. Uh, 67 and 68. This is the prayer of Zechariah. Zechariah just found out that he was his, his wife, his elderly wife, was going to have a son, John the Baptist, who was going to be the forerunner to the Messiah. And Zechariah gives a prayer here. 
And he says, And his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has, and there's our word, you see it? He has visited and redeemed his people. God didn't just come over and have a cup of coffee and talk with you for a few minutes and leave. God visited with the purpose of helping and aiding. He visited his people. That's what James is getting at. We need to do something to help orphans and widows in particular, anyone who is in distress in, 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 that you know in your life that you could help. Orphans and widows. Orphans and widows in Scripture are special people to the Lord. Did you know that? They are special people to the Lord. First of all, God has designed the family. The husband is the head of the home. He is a protection to the wife. Parents are over the children. They are a protector and a provider for the children. They do not have the human protection of a family or a husband. So the Lord himself becomes their protector. Let me show you a verse that shows that. Oh, and he often, ah, uh, uh, this is an important point. He often uses us to do that. Uh, here's a cross-reference, Psalm 68, verses 4 and 5. Sing to the Lord, sing praise to his name, lift up his song to him who rides through the deserts. Many of the commentators believe that this was written by David when he was running from Saul and he was out in the desert. That's why, that's why David, uh, lift up a song to him who rides through the deserts. His name is Jehovah, Yahweh is the Lord, all caps there. Exalt before him. Then verse 5 says this, okay? It says this, Father of the fatherless and protector of the widows. You know, it's real popular to do a study, and it's very profitable, to do a study of the names of God in the Old Testament. Uh, El Shaddai, uh, Jehovah, yeah, Rapha, Jehovah, Jireh, there's all, you know, all of those Hebrew names. Well, I want to tell you something. This is a name, is a title for God in the Old Testament. He is the father of the fatherless. That's a specific name. It just said his name is the Lord, exalt before him. And then it says the father of the fatherless, the protector of widows. Those are names given to God. God becomes protector of orphans, of fatherless. He becomes the helper of the widow lady. Cross-reference, Deuteronomy 24. This was built right into the law, put in the law. Talking to Israel as a whole. This is something you got to do. The Lord built into the Old Testament law provision for the poor, for the orphans, for the widows to be helped. This is what he says. When you reap your harvest in your field and forget a sheaf in the field, you dropped one, you left one behind, you shall not go back and get it. It shall be for the sojourner, for the orphan, for the fatherless, for the widow, that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. He builds it in that, you know, when they went out there and they would, they would um, bring in the fruit, um, they wouldn't be able to get all of it. They would leave handfuls that got dropped or sheaves that got dropped. I remember one time years ago we had a, a men's retreat and it was up in, in Hart, Michigan. Well, I don't know if you know that whole area. It's big apple orchards out there. And it was late fall. They had already harvested apples, but we walked through and there were apples, pretty good apples that were on the ground and that were still on the tree even after they had, had harvested. There were a few of them left there. That's what happens when you harvest. God says, don't go back and try to clean that up and gather it all back. You can just see the farmer. Oh, we left quite a bit out in the field there. Man, go back and gather up all that stuff that you left there. God says to them in the law, no, don't do that. Leave it so that the poor, so that the oppressed, so that the sojourner, so that the fatherless and the widow can go out and glean after you've gone through and they can get along. It was a way of providing for the orphans and widows in his day. I want to share a wonderful, wonderful story. You love, any of you watch, you ladies, <coughs> watch the Hallmark Channel. If you're a guy who watches the Hallmark Channel, don't raise your hand. Any of you ladies who watch the Hallmark 
oh, there are always, you know, these wonderful love stories and stuff. Well, we got one of those in the Bible. Found in the book of Ruth, chapter 2. Naomi and her husband had gone to a faraway country because there was famine in the land. <coughs> the boys had married, and the father died, and the two boys died, and there Naomi is in a foreign land with two daughter-in-laws, foreign daughter-in-laws. She heard things were going well back in Israel, so she's going to head back. But she told both of her daughter-in-laws, you go back to your family. Your husbands have died. Your widows, you, she was a widow, elderly widow lady. She told her daughter-in-laws, you go back to your family. One of them did. And you know the story. Ruth says, no, I'm going to stay with you. Your people are going to be my people, and your God is going to be my God. That's a famous quote from the book of Ruth. So Ruth, come back to... You know where they came back to, by the way? They came back to Bethlehem. They were from Bethlehem, generations before Jesus came to Bethlehem. Well, they come back, and Ruth says to elderly Naomi, Naomi, I'm going to go out and glean behind the harvesters today. Maybe there'll be some dropped and left behind, and I can get something for us to, to live on. So she goes out in the field, and she happened, it's kind of interesting the way the book of, of Ruth is written, she happened upon the field of Boaz. Well, I'll talk about the Lord's sovereignty there. And uh, when she arose to glean, Boaz instructed his young men, saying, let her glean even among the sheaves, and do not reproach her. Come on. And also pull out some from the bundles for her and leave it for her to glean and do not rebuke her. He kind of liked her. When he first got there, he says, hey, who's that pretty girl out there? You know, and they told her who she was and everything. And so Boaz tells his workers, as you are gleaning, um, don't do as an efficient job of, what, of gleaning as what you usually do. I want you to accidentally leave some extra behind so that this gal can have a pretty, and she did. By the end of the day, she, it says she beat it out, so she beat the wheat stalks so that the grain come out, and she come home to Naomi, and, and she had a whole bunch of grains. You know, I did really well today, you know. Well, that's because Boaz had instructed for them to leave. Why? Because she was a widow. Naomi was a widow. God wants us to help the orphans and the widows. But not just the orphans and widows. James uses the category of orphans and widows to represent anyone who is in distressed situation in life. We, in an act of worshiping the Lord, remember that word religion, uh, can help those who are poor, distressed, going through rough times in life, those who are unpopular or looked down on, those who have made bad choices and are suffering from those choices. Those are the kinds of people, and we all have those in our lives, people that we know. You as a Christian, a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, can worship the Lord, can honor the Lord by going to them and helping them. That is an act of worship for you to go and help them. I'm going to read, I, I want to read something for you. I, I was working on this message, and this is, I, I read our Daily Bread. That's a, a devotional book uh, from, from Radio Bible Class here in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, but it goes worldwide. But this, this is a devotional for, I think it was Wednesday morning. In Japan, food products are immaculately prepared and packaged. Not only must they taste good, but they must look good, too, because the Japanese emphasis on good quality products with slight defects are often, products with slight defects are often discarded, okay, like a second-hand store. However, in recent years, wakiri products, that's the word they use, have gained popularity. Wakiri means there is a reason. Isn't that interesting? The Japanese word wakiri means there is a reason these products have been set aside because there's some defect in it. Okay? Wakiri products, uh, wakiri means there is a reason in Japanese. These products are not thrown away but are sold at a cheaper price for a reason. For example, a crack in the rice cracker. You get some rice crackers that got bumped and they got cracks in them and they can't sell them for full price, so they sell them for a, at a second-rate store. We have those kinds of stores around as well. My friend who lived in Japan tells me that wakiri, this is what's interesting, 
is also used as a catchphrase for people who are obviously less than perfect. So they have taken that word that had normally been used of food products that have been damaged, and they have applied it to people. They call them Wakiri people. Jesus loves Wakiri people. I thought that was great. Which includes you and me. The greatest demonstration of his love is for us is that while we were still sinners, we were Wakiri, Christ died for us. But this goes on and talks about how we can help Wakiri people in our lives. That's what he's talking about here. Damaged people, orphans and widows who have a distress in their life, have a difficult time. We can help them financially. We can help them emotionally. We can become a friend to them and aid them in whatever ways we can. Most of all, we can share the gospel with them and show them the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. How many of these kinds of people do you visit in order to help? That's that definition of that word, visit. Huh? Think about that. Think about picking up some of these kinds of people in your life. Living a pure life, verse 37, 27, B. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit the orphans and widows, and, here's the end of it, to keep oneself unstained from the world. We need to keep ourselves pure, unstained from the world. James uses the word um, ospilos, ospilos, literally meaning no spot or no stain. Now, when I saw that, I knew that it's on the beginning there, that when you put an alpha on the beginning of a Greek word, it's like putting a un on the front of an English word. You know, it, it, re, re, it makes it the opposite. We say stoppable, unstoppable. We say, you know, we put a U in there. The Greeks put an alpha, their, their letter A on the front of it, and that made it the opposite. And so, so the, the word spillos literally means a spot or a stain. So I right away thought, I wonder if our English word to spill, you know, you're drinking a couple of coffee and you spill it all over your shirt, you're all dressed for work, and you got your tie on, and you, well, maybe you don't wear a tie over, but you got your good shirt on, you're all ready to go, you're drinking your cup of coffee in the morning, and you spill it all over your shirt. You know, so I was going to see, so I looked at the, the etymology, that means the root, where did it come from? The etymology of our word spill, and it doesn't come from this Greek word, though. I was hoping it would. I thought that would be. But it comes from the word aspilos, which literally means no spot, no stain. So that says this. As a Christian, we are forgiven and we are blameless before God, but sin in our lives causes us to have spots and stains in our worship of the Lord. True religion, true worship of the Lord in our daily life is to be unspotted from the world. Now, uh, here's a, here's, I could pick up on that word world and I could preach for hours on that word world. And we got, we probably got two, three hours yet. So I'm going to go ahead. No, well, I'm almost done here. I could pick up on that word world. World does not mean the earth. But as you know, when the Bible uses the word world, it's talking about Satan's organized system. John says this in 1 John, do not love the world or the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. Come on. For all that is in the world, and then he divides it into three categories, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life, uh, is not from the Father, but is from the world. James says we need to keep ourselves unspotted from the world. Another cross-reference, Romans 12:2. You remember Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is a reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world. Come on. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Do not be conformed to this word. The Greek word used there literally means being pressed into a mold so that it gets reshaped. The world wants to press us into its mold. James says we need to keep ourselves unspotted from the world. Okay, 
I've come to conclusion. James' word, religion, refers to our worship of God with our daily life actions. You walk out of here, I want you to remember that. We have religion every day of our lives, meaning the actions that we do can bring honor to the Lord. This text shows that we can worship Him in three areas. We can worship Him by controlling, by bridling our tongue. We can worship him by God by helping the afflicted, especially the widows and the orphans. And we can worship God by keeping our lives clean from worldliness and sin. All right, I'm going to close with a video, a special video. It's a special video to me. It may not mean as much to you, but we had visited, uh, visited the Pines uh, Christian Care Center. It is a, an orphanage in South Africa. It is an aid.